In 2020, some of the oil and gas sector, many of the super major companies, the likes of Exxon, BP and Royal Dutch Shell, were trading at huge discounts to their fair value. These have excellent balance sheets and have been offering up significant dividend yields despite cuts from many of the big players. Why has Fundsmith not purchased or added any of these businesses to the portfolio? Whilst I appreciate that electric vehicles will take off, planes, trains and even the beloved Tesla all need energy to run and the majority of that continues to be provided by fossil fuels. And this has been represented by the recovery in the price of crude oil. All right. Do you think the questioner was an intentional pun when he said electric vehicles will take off? Do you, do you... <laughs> um, we don't own any oil uh, and gas companies. Uh, we're never going to own any oil and gas companies. Uh, I mean, we will deal with the particulars of him talking about them being at huge discounts to fair value and, and dividend yields. But let me deal with the generality first, and then I'll hand over to Julian. I know he's uh, made up a slide on the oil and gas companies to the particulars of the question. Why don't we own oil and gas companies? We are trying to own businesses that can go on delivering value forever, basically which basically means businesses where there is at least a hope of constant growth over time. Not, not, not the same growth in every period or non-cyclical growth. Everything's got a bit of cyclical, but things where uh, they can keep on developing new products and new brands and find new markets and new consumers and increase prices and keep on growing forever. Um, clearly a business where in, in reaching a valuation, the word depletion comes into it is not the same sort of business. Yeah? We're talking about something with a literally finite value. I know you can go off and discover more of the stuff, but at any one moment, what you, and you've got a machine for doing that in, in your business, but in any one moment, what you've got is decreasing in value over time. And I know you can find more stuff, but increasing the stuff you find is difficult. It's, it's not, much, not much of it being found in Texas these days, right? It's found in places which are geologically, geographically, politically, climatically hostile and so on. Secondly, it's a commodity. We like companies that create an intangible value that enables them to have premium pricing and premium returns. People who own brands, control of distribution, know-how, patents, uh, locked in clients in software or hardware that they can sell spares and service to. Oil and gas is a commodity. My car can't tell the difference between one petrol and another, basically. Uh, you know, research that people have done historically on uh, people buying gas stations, uh, buying, uh, you know, petrol or gas station uh, uh, purchases is they say to them, so which brand do you favour? And they go, well, it's the one on the left after the traffic lights. They go, yeah, but is it Shell or is it Exxon or is it BP? They go, I haven't got a clue. It's the one on the left after the traffic lights. And it's like, oh, right, OK. It doesn't have any brand value. It's also got a huge element of cyclicality. We don't like companies which are very cyclical. Um, like everything has a bit of cyclicality. One of, the, one of the things people have said to us over the years is, oh, Terry, you like investing in non-cyclical businesses. I say to them, well, I've actually been in work 47 years this year and I haven't found one yet. Um, but what we don't like is things that are heavily cyclical. We like things where even at the bottom of their business cycle, they're still making a very good return, like our companies have done in the last year, for example. In these particular companies at the bottom of the cycle, there ain't no return. Uh, basically. All right. Jules, do you want to talk about the, the sort of uh, discounts to fair values or more particularly yield um, element of this that this questioner raises? Yes, we have, a, we have a slide here which is entitled Living Beyond Their Means. Um, I want you to imagine that you have a business partner or business partners and they come to you and say, why don't we go and uh, do the following? Borrow a million pounds or a million dollars from the bank, um, pay ourselves a, a million dollar or a million pound special dividend and then we'll be a million pounds richer. You would say to them, well, hang on a second, don't we still owe the bank a million pounds and we'll probably have to pay tax on the dividends and so actually we'll be certainly not richer and actually poorer. Um, this is basically what the oil companies have been doing um, for the last 10 years. So here we have a, um, you'll see in the second column, hopefully you're, you're looking at this, it says free cash flow. So this is basically the cash that they have left over after they've paid their, uh, their capex, they spent money on their capex to pay uh, their dividends. Um, and in all cases, you can see that the companies have paid out very significantly more um, than they've earned in free cash flow. Um, and then you might say, well, how have they done that? And the answer is, well, they've just gone out and borrowed the money. So in all cases, their net debt has gone up dramatically. Um, so to the questioner's point, um, I mean, 
the, the questioner is uh, perfectly, fair value is a perfectly legitimate concept. The, 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 the questioner is obviously um, perfectly entitled to think that these companies are trading at a discount to fair value. But I mean, for the record, um, there is no magic book of truth when it comes to fair value. Um, and in terms of excellent balance sheet and dividend yields, um, uh, we would, I think, disagree with the contention. I'd also just to kind of put in a plug for one of our companies, which in some senses uh, has some similarities, and that's Philip Morris International, in, in the sense that, like um, tobacco companies, like oil companies, have a, you know, there's, a, there's a, obviously a, a secular challenge. Um, and then where, where tobacco companies, where, where oil companies have the problem of the oil price, tobacco companies, in our case, Philip Morris, have a big problem, as I mentioned earlier, with emerging market currencies. Philip Morris has responded to this by, by A, cutting it by ceasing share buybacks altogether, B, in its, the strength of its balance sheet, and C, to spend a vast amount of money, which it otherwise might have you know, returned to shareholders, as the saying goes, to invent an entirely new business for itself in, in heat not burn tobacco. So we think that's the way to go, not, not, not to not to, to somehow, I mean, there's this tremendous institutional imperative in the UK to pay dividends, and there's a tremendous institutional imperative uh, in the US to buy back stock. And I think that companies that give in to that um, uh, without sufficient cash to do so are playing a pretty dangerous game.